Over the last five weeks, our Tuesday Bible study has read the entire book of Lamentations. Now, I know what some may be thinking. Wow, the whole book in five sessions. And that may sound more impressive than it is, since the book only has five chapters, so that makes it easy. One per week. We read Lamentations not because it is the most uplifting book in the Bible, but in many ways for the exact opposite reason. It is hard. It is a desolate and sad book. It is a book of, well, lamenting. I bring this up here to, A, maybe tweak your interest in which book will we be reading next, and the answer to that is the book of Numbers, starting on the 28th. Next week, we're just looking at the following week's gospel. But B, more importantly, to underline the power that we find reading Lamentations is the power to sit in the laments, the sadness, the bitterness, and the desolation, and to know that God is with us, even when the exterior signs seem to point to the contrary. Lamentations is riddled with trauma and abandonment and people crying, Why, Lord, why? And when, Lord, when? And these are all woven together into desperate prayers. And it draws to a close in an odd and anxious tension between praying for restoration and ending in what seems like God's silence. I offer you this brief synopsis because I believe that the power of lamentations is that it breaks the egg, so to speak, on feelings that are okay to have. It's okay to be angry, to be bitter, to be frustrated with God. The author of Lamentations surely was. Beyond that author, look across the Old Testament. Jonah was bitter as he approached Nineveh. Moses was frustrated leading the Israelites. And then in the New Testament, arguably, Jesus was angry with God while he was hanging from the cross and yelled, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And yet, this is good news. This is good news because God's love absorbs our bitterness, our frustration, and our anger. God's love is still there beyond the myriad of human emotions. And in the face of our emotions, God can handle them all. It is a powerful reminder that God is there too. In the moments that we are sad and angry and bitter and frustrated and even feel alone, God is there, ever faithful, ever loving us. I think that sometimes we sell ourselves short, or at least sell our emotions short. We look to church, we look to faith for happiness, for joy, for comfort. We go into prayer looking for things to make sense, to even out. And when it doesn't, when things don't make sense to us, we might not know what to do with that. When we are left feeling angry or frustrated or bitter with God, we might even find a sense of shame tied to it. Like, I need to go deal with myself before I bring myself to God. But the truth is that God is already there. As famed Christian author C.S. Lewis once wrote, it's okay to be angry at God. God, the creator of everything, can surely handle it. And God, the creator of everything, certainly still loves you. Plus, to be fair, God wants us to bring our whole selves to him, and that includes the parts of us that are bitter or frustrated or overwhelmed parts of ourself that are traumatized. It's that simple. Scripture offers us far more than only the powerfully positive story of Easter morning or the holy glow of the nativity in that little town called Bethlehem. Throughout the pages of Scripture, there are the follies of Peter, the loss of family experienced by Naomi, the sorrow and frustration of Paul writing to those early churches, and the wisdom of Proverbs. Across the pages of Scripture, we find the full spectrum of human experiences on display for us. And the truth 
is that God wants it all from us. God wants our full selves. This is a truth that is as simple as it is profound. Now, the book of Proverbs is interesting, as it is a collection of wisdom sayings that are tied back to the time of King Solomon, that wisest of the kings. And I know wisdom sayings may sound fancy, but as a native southerner, I come from a culture that is rich in wisdom sayings. Sayings like, a new broom sweeps clean, but an old broom knows where the dirt is. How about this one? All the buzzards come to the mule's funeral. Or a favorite of mine. A cat can have kittens in an oven, but that don't make them biscuits. These bits of insights were often doled out by old men sitting around small southern towns like the one that I was raised in, typically at barber shops or at local pool halls or restaurants. And it's these kinds of pearls of wisdom that we find throughout the book of Proverbs. On the other hand, what we do not find is any real mention of the key events that shaped Israel's history. In fact, in a way, Proverbs almost seems to be in contrast with the teaching of Israel that is center to most of the Torah, those first five books of the Bible, because the subject matter is so different. In Proverbs, we do not have histories or Ten Commandments. And to be honest, that may feel odd. It may even lead some readers to ask, why is this included in the Old Testament? Though another way to think about that is that Proverbs offers us, the reader, yet another road to travel in our understanding of our lives and our relationship with God. To be frank, wisdom writings in Proverbs play out much like an ancient self-help book aimed to help us live our best lives. Though at its core, it does emphasize the fear of the Lord as foundational to wisdom, the true starting point of wisdom. Here, fear means awe and respect and love, not to be frightened. It's with wisdom that that insight comes. Proverbs presents us with knowledge gained through life that has been passed down, like the old men in the barber shops of my childhood speaking to me out of their lives' experiences, trying to impart the wisdom that they had gathered. If only I would listen. In our Old Testament reading this morning, the image is of wisdom who builds her house to invite all people to her table. Throughout the book of Proverbs, wisdom is personified as a female, and here she has built a house, set a table, and sent out maidservants to invite in all who will listen. It's an invitation to eat and to drink, to stride on the way to discernment to the best life possible. Come and listen, taste and see, learn and grow. That invitation is to all who want to learn, those who want to know more, people who want to live and grow in the ways of wisdom. In a brilliant poetic twist, wisdom is both setting the table for us, and our wisdom is coming to fruition in our responding to the invitation that was sent out. For wisdom is many different things. Wisdom is knowledge and imagination. Wisdom is discipline and piety. Wisdom is order and instruction. Wisdom is a gift that we live in and a process we live throughout our lives. Making wise the simple. Allowing us to see the deep care and love of God for us and all creation in even the simplest things around us. Yes, during the joyful and happy moments of life, but also among our laments, our ignorance, our sadness, and even our anger. Wisdom lets us know where to start in our awe and love and respect for God Almighty. Awe for the power and majesty of the creator of all things and respect for the one who wants all parts of us, the good, the bad, and the ugly. For we are formed, known, and we are loved 
by God Almighty. It is as simple as it is powerful. To make wise the simple, to see the wisdom of God in all things, the simple setting of a table and an invitation to all people, and also to make simple the wise, to understand beyond the theology and the libraries filled with books, that there is a simple truth, that the God who created all sent his Son so that all may be saved on our good days and especially on our bad ones. Thanks be to God.